um, community support, family support, and economic status do have a lot to do with homelessness, of course. We have people in our streets right now, in our living in bushes, living in tents, under tarps, in Bellingham and all over Washington, under bridges, who are engineers. People with two jobs and a family living in a, in a, in a car. And it's hard to talk about it myself without feeling the real compassion for these people because it's awful. And, and the narrative that you'll hear a lot from our government officials is they are, they're doing, they're spending millions. And they want to be seen as spending those millions too. They want, and they want you to see that they're, they're trying. What, the systems that we've been using are some pretty old systems, some antiquated systems, and the results are what we see. We're increasing homelessness, we're increasing hopelessness. Yes, some people are, some of the lucky people are trans, transforming their lives and getting into some housing. There's a lot of priority on those families with kids too because it's really important that we don't continue a cycle of homelessness, you know, generational homelessness. Um, it's a goal, but we failed it. So we need to think outside the box. But community is indeed the answer, and so community is something that, that I've tried to engage in. Heather, could you tell them how we met? Oh, okay, it was 2019. February, right? February, and it was the longest six-week cold spell that Billingham has had, like, since, I don't know, I mean, in years. And it's probably the, the late 80s or something. Right? Yeah, and people were freezing. Animals were freezing. Birds were freezing. Everything was, like, dying, and, and there was no way that the people that were out on the street were going to survive it. And Homes Now was an organization, and they had raised about seven or eight thousand dollars to go towards their big dream of tiny home communities. And Jim, at the time, he said, "If we don't spend this money now and get these people off the street, they're going to die." So he contacted all of us who had vehicles, and we went out on the street looking for people. We were driving up and down, and we'd say, "Are you homeless? Do you have a place to get warm?" No. And we were going behind Walmart. We were pulling them out of the woods. And it was, you know, some of that was scary. But we were like, hello, are you back there? Do you need help? And they would come out with their dogs and their moms. And they were cold. And, and then we'd get them in help. cars. They, they did. They needed help. They really wanted help. Yeah. And we, we took them to hotel rooms. And thank goodness for that hotel room allowing all those people to show up. And we just paid for them to stay in these hotel rooms. And yeah, Homes Now dropped about $30,000 in six weeks with donated money from, from, from the community and uh, with, with community members, individual citizens, what we call the Citizens Outreach Team, having been funded by Homes Now largely, but it was an independent group of citizens who just cared enough to not let their neighbors die in the street in front of them. And so this really lit the advocacy up. She mentioned Homes Now. Heather mentioned Homes Now. Homes Now is um, how I got to know Homes Now. Okay, I, let me go briefly on my experience. We heard a little bit about Heather's experience with brushes with uh, housing insecurity, and that's what we call that when we can't, we're not sure where our next shelter is coming from. And even, even with good economic status, if something bad happens in your life, you can take a tumble real quickly and not be able to recover financially. And, and, and so we're, you know, we need to try to soften the blow that it is between housed and poof, not housed and, all, and living on the street and being you know, hated by your neighbors and treated like garbage by police. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's awful. It's awful. And, and so we are here trying to witness all of it. Homes Now, okay, the, I, I need to backtrack. Who am I? Who, where did I come from? I, I moved here from Minnesota at 14 years old. I was on my own. I lived on Lummi Island. It was, I landed on Lummi Island, I got really lucky, and at that time, back in the 80s, uh, nobody batted an eye when this, you know, they gave me a chance at 14 to let me live among them in their community, and again, community was my answer. At 14, I didn't stand a chance. I, I didn't know that I didn't stand a chance because I fell into a community that would allow me to be. I didn't even know how housing insecure I was. What I ended up doing was I started fishing out there, reef netting off Lummi Island, <clears throat> where I quickly became a, a, a well-known fisherman, a good fisherman out there, a part of the community. But where I lived 
was in a tiny home village. Not like put on by Home Now or some nonprofit, but what built America were the tiny homes, the company towns, the, the uh, agricultural housing that we still have shelters for people out you know, in, in the fields. We have uh, timber housing, cannery housing for all the fishing that was going on here. Um, so, and I was in a fisherman's village, the tiny homes. And what that meant was the guy who owned several licenses needed somebody highly trained. And this is a very neat, you know, you don't, if you don't know how to reef net, you don't know how to reef net. So once you train somebody, you don't want them to go away and have to train somebody again the next year. You want that trained individual to be there for you. So this is how company towns have always built America. They needed, the they needed a trained workforce to be there. And what they did was they provided shelter at a very cheap rate so that they would have trained workers available when the season started up. So that's how I lived, and I didn't know how housing insecure it was. I did know that I was paying ridiculous rent. $20 a month paid for my electricity. I used an outhouse, and I hauled my own water. I lived in a small cabin in the woods, and I considered myself part of community. It never dawned on me that I might be one step away from having to go into Bellingham and live on the streets. And so when I saw Homes Now start up, they had a camp out, a, a much more organized camp out than we saw in Bellingham last year. But they had a camp out at City Hall, and they hosted it. And they invited in the campers who had no place to go in Bellingham. And, 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 and the, the city allowed them to permit it for a while. And they did that. They raised the awareness. They raised my awareness. I'm like, what's going on with this group of people? Why don't they have shelter? So as I was watching this all unfold, I watched Jim. She mentioned Jim Peterson. as He was running Homes Now at that time. He was the executive uh, of, of Homes Now. And he had 12 years of homelessness under him. And he decided he was going to do something about it. So bless him for doing it. Um, so Jim was putting out a call, videos on Facebook and stuff saying, can you come to City Hall and support Homes Now and tiny home villages? That's what I want you to do. And I wanted to know more about it, so I showed up. And I sat and I watched homeless people who were very well spoken. Again, these are people who are you know, educated people who are living in our woods. There's people who, their families, you know, there's names in this town who share the same name from the people who live on the streets of Bellingham. And those not, they're not just, it doesn't happen to be the same name, like that's the family. These, are, these people are from here. And that's, that's one of the big misnomers you'll hear is that so many people are coming from out of town. It's not really a fact. Very few people come from out of town. Just as many people leave our town to go somewhere else to strike good fortune as people coming here because we don't have the services here for anybody. It's not like we're attracting them. And so it's a big fear that a lot of government leaders have and, and we need to, and, and we all need to address uh, in our own minds um, that, that, uh, that if we build services here that, are, that will bring people in, then we might attract people from another city to come. What are we worried about that for? If we solve it here, we can solve it in their city. Why do they want to leave their city where the streets are named after their family? It's no more than, than you do want to leave here. You wouldn't want to leave your family here, even if you can't live in the same house because your mom's on a housing program and she just can't have anybody else in the house. But, but you want to, so you know, you go there for showers and you go there for meals sometimes, but you live on the streets. And that's what happens. Lots of reasons why people are homeless. So Homes Now was calling for these people to come and speak. And I sat and I listened. And I saw people crying. I saw people yelling. I saw people begging for services and saying they just needed a place where they could hold still, where they could set down their backpack and not have it ripped off so they could go get that job, so that they could go to the doctor, so that, you know, a place you know, that they could lock up their stuff for a little while. The tiny home village does that. So the storage, safe storage is a big issue, but it's only this much of it. But what most people need is a shelter. It's called the housing first model. And if you, the, the idea is if you bring somebody in under a roof, then you hold them still, assess them, and say, what do you need? Well, then, then, you know, bring in counselors. And find, do you have a drug addiction issue? Let's start working on that here. Not like, let's take you into treatment, then you get out of treatment and back onto the street. 
And that is what happens. And of course, back onto the street with an addiction issue, recidivism is called. You're going to go back to that life a lot. It just happens. You run into an old friend, it's like, hey, you want some of this? You know? And it's like, that's what they do. So when you have a tiny home village with some structure around, then you can invite people into hold still and get these services. So I was watching people pitch this. I was watching advocates say, this is what we want to build. I was watching uh, homeless folks saying, this is what we need. And it would provide so much structure, so much, uh, so much ability for me to do what I want with my life so I don't have to be homeless anymore, so I can end this cycle. And I heard them saying this, and then I was just like, I was like, I can't believe that this is, that, that this is something we're asking for. So, you know, you always get to raise your hand and, and speak uh, in, in, uh, in, in uh, public, excuse me, public, in, in public comment in uh, city councils and uh, county councils. So I stood up and I said, I'm Marcus D. I think I'm the last person to have enjoyed tiny home living in Whatcom County. And I can tell you it really works. At 14 years old, I moved into this cabin. I had a dog, so I had to have a reason to come home every night and take care of my dog. And everything. <laughs> but I had an alarm clock. An alarm clock gets you up every morning, right? If you're living in a tent out in the woods, you don't. And why? Why would I have an alarm clock? What am I going to do today? I'll wake up when I want to wake up. But because I had that stability, and I had an alarm clock, I woke up and caught the bus. And I went to high school in Ferndale. I mean, I caught a bus from, from where I was. It went around the island. We ended up at the ferry dock. I got on the ferry, walked across with the other kids, got on another bus, went to the Belling, to, to Fairhaven, up to, to Ferndale High School, and then did that same thing back every day. It allowed me to do that. I did that on my own. I had, you know, I signed documents with my own counselor and said, sometimes I need to go fish, and I need to be able to write my own excuses. They let me do that. I don't know if you could do that anymore. I don't know if anybody could ever do that. But I got away with that. So when I saw these people begging for the stability that I had fallen into, and didn't have any idea how lucky I was, then I saw how lucky I was. And it really sparked it in me. That, that, you know, people say, there's a phrase, there but by the grace of God go I, right? That's what they say, you know? You see somebody on the corner, you say, well, there but by the grace of God go I, you know, bless them. And then they keep walking. Pick him up. That's where we're at. One time Marcus actually said that to me, because I, I said to him, when I, you know, I'm helping people on the street, I really get how lucky I am that I'm not on the street. And I said, there, but for the grace of God, go I. And he says, really? They're not graced? Has the grace of God left that person? Maybe we should help them anyway. So I really got, of course they, they're graced. Maybe I'm that instrument to help them be blessed. Boom. And it is that easy. When you, then when you start engaging with people, you realize they're just people. Some of them do have problems. I mean, one night of homelessness in the streets of Whatcom County, right, in any of our cities, you'd, you'd think it wouldn't be that bad. It's bad. One night can give you enough trauma to change everything in your head for the rest of your life. You get jumpy. You, you don't trust people. You start closing in. People don't talk to you. People tell you that, that you stink. Yeah. So it's, it's really difficult. It's, it's, it's really difficult, but it's not insurmountable. Community is the answer. And, and when we built our first tiny home community, it took a lot. What did we do? How did we do that? Again, we find ourselves in city councils asking for a space to build a safe tent encampment at the time. Just like, at least give us a tent encampment, a place where people can safely camp and not have the cops chase them out of there and disrupt everything. If you're not home when the cops get there, you lose everything. You lose it. So now you're homeless. You don't have a blanket or a shirt. And you're loose on the streets of Bellingham. Sweeps, they call that sweeps create crime overnight you're looking for a blanket tonight so you don't die so you go and you're looking on the back porch of somebody's you know there's there's a dog blanket it's stinky it's covered with fur you're gonna grab that or you're gonna die that's where we're at or if, if you go to big five i was um, buying a bunch of tents for the homeless and they said they have to be locked up they have to literally like work with me 
to give them a tent because when people have their tents taken away from them and they don't have a home anymore to cover them up, they run into Big Five and they try to grab tents and they run out just to put something over their head. Homelessness creates that. It does. And, I, and what, you know, it, 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 not the homelessness, the sweeps, the way we respond to homelessness creates crime. That's, I, I guess I want to be clear about but But homelessness creates scenarios where drug addiction, where alcoholism, where physical abuse, sexual abuse, all of these things happen because there's a lack of services, because there's no support, because there's hopelessness. The biggest cause of drug abuse in our streets is hopelessness. When I see hope rising, when our advocacy and other advocates bring a little hope to the picture, drug abuse plummets. They're like, yeah, I want to form community. Community sounds good to me, I want in. And they try. And then we fail, then we all fail, and they go, ah, we tried. And they go hopeless again. And it's a drag. So I'm not giving up for them. A lot of them are my friends now. And so I, you know, I mean, you build those relationships. Of course, there's lots of problems, though. There's lots of reasons why people get home. You know, you, you have a physical disability. You're, you're a veteran. You know, veterans end up on the streets. Do you think they paid? They paid for this country, right? People who are, are on pensions, fixed, fixed income, they don't have enough money to buy the starting level apartment, and they're never going to have that money. They try to live in a car. The car gets towed when they're not there. Now they have nothing. Welcome to the gutter. Welcome to going to the congregate shelter base camp in Bellingham, where all kinds of horrible things happen in there, too. They're trying their very best. They're a friendly nonprofit church in your city, in Bellingham, in your county, who's supposed to try to take everybody in. They can't. And so there's literally unserved in our community right now. The counts, the, the official counts that are out there are not accurate either. It's probably fair to say there's over a thousand people in Whatcom County who cannot or will not take advantage of any of the services that are provided right now for a number of reasons. Yeah. But go ahead. That's a good question. I guess we could probably average it out around maybe five in our community in, 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 um, that I know of. It's not something that we advertise a lot um, for obvious reasons because there are advocacies out there that get pretty upset when they hear about people dying. And so it's kind of secreted away by our government in some ways. I, I don't mean to like put an us and them in government because I think that the solution is a partnership between community members and government. I mean, I don't think the government can do it all alone. They do need a, go ahead. That's a good question too. I, I don't have those numbers with me. I, I, I should have some of that. Um, I, I think that like families with children, uh, and that's, those are kids that are lucky enough to have you know, parents with them. That, that number may be somewhere, I'm thinking like, over a hundred families right around in there in Whatcom County. Um, and I've seen those numbers. It's, it's hard to really get a gauge on it too. The, the, uh, the pandemic has really driven a lot of families into their cars. And then it's hard to quantify them until you meet and engage each one of them. Why are you here? What do you, you know? So, so we do have a lot more families with kids ending up in cars. When you see people that are parked along the streets with RVs and cars, um, you see, you see a lot of nice cars come out, you know, because there were, you know, there were people who just can't afford an apartment, but they still had a family car. They had but then when they lose that car, then, then they've really become destitute in our county quickly. There are services available. Lydia Place is one of the, one of the uh, places where, where families with children and single women with children often find some shelter there. Often they go to motel stays, um, which is very expensive. It's a stopgap measure. It's not preferred. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a great place to raise children in in a motel. Um, it's just the instability of it. It's like well, not this motel, but now the next motel, like that. It gets. Um, people need stability. Kids need stability. It's also hard to count because it happens so much where people are sharing homes or living with their friends for a certain amount of time until their friends can't do it anymore. And I personally have had a mother and her daughter who are 14 years old on and off in our home for over five years. 
and most of the and it was she wasn't counted because she had a home even though she was on my couch when I got up in the morning I walked by her every day and then her daughter shared the bedroom with our daughter and but she, they, it wasn't really their home they just were allowed to be there and cook and eat and shower and and I mean we welcomed them but we didn't have an extra bedroom for the mom and it wasn't really ideal and we had to literally make her leave so that she qualified for housing and she had to be shown that she was in a tent with her daughter in order to qualify so we chose to do it in the summer when they could camp and be the safest and and stay in our yard <laughs> and literally because of people like catch them living in our house and they all of a sudden don't qualify again and because we had to kick them out just so that they could qualify so they could get a house for a certain amount of time out on the, you know, outside, they finally qualified. And now they have housing. And it's, you know, and then they have a lot of paperwork to do all the time. And they have to always prove it that they still get this housing, that they still need this housing. Mm -hmm. And then her daughter is um, got really sick from COVID. And she's one of those, like, she has a cane now. She really got really, really sick. And her daughter's like 16. Well, she's going to be 18 soon. And then what happens? The mom now won't qualify with her daughter, but she still might have to take care of her daughter. Even though she's 18, she's still a little girl that's like hurt. So, you know, it's tough. Yeah, go ahead. It is definitely more men, um, maybe three times or more, more men than women. Um, and it's difficult to uh, come up with reasons for that other than we as a compassionate society tend to look out for women with kids a little bit more and help, you know, help them out. We don't want to see them. With, and you're right, they're much more vulnerable on the street. Um, abuse and uh, other issues on the street are... It's, it's not a safe place for anybody to be on the streets uh, at night. People with people with severe mental disorders are somewhere. The last I heard was somewhere around 18 percent of the homeless population, and so those people uh, who desperately need care were not getting that care, and nobody's going to just take them off the street and put them into care unless they're in such terrible shape that you know. The, as, as Heather says, if you don't qualify for services, you don't get the services. And the qualification for services almost require you to be down at the rock bottom. You have to have gone through the abuses, have to have gone through the, the suffering, have to have gone, you know, one night being set up in a tent, even with the best intention, could have put so much trauma on that family that it could take the rest of their lifetime to process it. No, you don't have to pay for it. Um, some shelters kind of require some participation. The, the Bellingham Mission used to um, ask for more to give from people, but they've, they've relaxed that over the years of, because of this advocacy, because more people care um, to ask those questions. It's like, well, why can't this person come in? Well, like, there's really no reason they can't come in. They just wouldn't work for us, or whatever that is. Some of them have religious requirements. Uh, this, this one used to have more religious requirements you have to attend services with. And some people really are not into attending services, you know? And they're like, they, for whatever reason, they had trauma in their lives that was related to religion. And they don't want anything to do with it. And they feel that that's horrible, so they stay out. And some people say that they would rather die than go into some of these places. Sometimes there's abuses inside the shelter. Sometimes there's, there's rape, there's drugs, there's people losing their teeth and losing everything they belong inside our shelters. So we or they're be screaming all night because yeah, of so mental illness. Sure, sure, the mental I, illness issues. Sure. I think we had a question over here. Go ahead. Ever what? We constantly run out of room in the shelter. Um, the the current congregate shelter in Bellingham, the main the main shelter that we have, um, I think the last time that it was truly at its fullest capacity, it's been very close to capacity. And just this last winter, 
but the winter before we were at capacity and it triggered uh, people to who wanted to take shelter to go to camp out at City Hall. Many of you are aware of the, the big, uh, that there was a it, was a, it was a protest, but it was of uh, people who had presented themselves to government asking for help, asking for shelter, and then um, when nobody would step up to help them, a group of people who did step up to help them kind of brought a political agenda with them too. And, and so, you know, it's like um, anytime you get groups of people together with no real structure, you've got kind of a, a power vacuum, you know, a, a place where just about anybody could come in and bring order and then bring their agenda. And it's, it's our own fault for letting it get there. You know, it's, uh, it's really important when people say that the, the protesters had their negative aspects. Those protesters, whatever you say about them, saved those people's lives for months when no, when no government entity would even vaguely try to help them. And, and, and as an advocate, as an official county advocate at the time, I was trying to liaison that information to try to let them know that we need your help out here. Can we get services brought here? And um, the services were denied. I'm not going to lie. Our government does what they do, and they say, we're done. And we can't just stop when you see people are going to die on your lawn. Right? So citizens come in to fill that power vacuum. It could have been a bunch of people with guns could have come in there and said, we've got an agenda and we're taking care of these people, hamburgers for everybody, and we might have let them. So in a way, we kind of got lucky that a bunch of uh, college kids with 